it is time. And it is the fourth time that we have started recording this podcast because yeah. you and I are children and we have each made not funny jokes and laughed too long at them and then awkward silences mm-hmm. afterwards and then one of us begging the other, please, please stop please the hit recording. Record again. Yep. So um, if you're in the elite status at Down to Mission Church and you want to hear the, the first three two-minute recordings, blooper reel, blooper reel you can come talk to me or Pastor Chris. Or if you are in the elite status, you probably know us fairly well, which means you already hear enough All bloopers stupidity. from yeah. us. Yeah. You know what the best thing about Christianity is? Everybody's elite status. Because we all have the righteousness of Christ. Because we're all We losers. don't have two, three-tier membership in the That's church. That's true. That's Everyone, correct. Jew, Greek, male, female, equal. Funny, not funny. Yeah. Yep. I was just talking with uh, someone this week about the creation of man and woman and how from the very beginning we see equal in dignity, different in function. Yeah. Male and female, he created them in the image of God. He created them to have dominion over the fish in the sea. He created them, and yet he creates Adam outside of the garden, before <laughs> the garden, from dust, creates Eve inside of the garden, from the rib, as a helper, and you see in God's design that we can have... Different functions, the same dignity. And I think that's a good thing to be reminded of is uh, kind of the prevailing cultural wind is if you're not exactly equal in all things, you're not equal, but the Bible Mm. says equal in dignity, different in function. It's a good reminder, Josh, when I remember that you and I have the same dignity, but you are much more important as a human being than I am. Oh my goodness, Chris. (laughs) (laughs) Is this this gonna be an hour-long pastoral counseling session? Oh, you know, we were just talking, uh, whoever's listening, if anybody's listening, uh, about a, uh, I guess, uh, a future series of episodes talking about Christians and counseling. Yeah. And uh, I very much appreciate opportunities I've had to be in, in counseling sessions. Uh, I, I want to remove that stigma from Christians and and uh, help people understand that mental health, emotional health is important, and it's an aspect of how we love God. And so that being said, I know I have importance, Josh, and I know I have dignity and value. I'm and, so happy. I want yeah. I want you to record that, though, and play, and play it, it to like myself. a text tone yeah. so that every time someone texts you, you can be reminded of it. Yeah, Yeah, it might sound a little weird. To anybody who's listening in the grocery store, but um, I can just remind myself of how important I really am. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So yeah, let's uh, talk about on our one of our last episodes about the Holy Spirit that we're going to let our yes be yes. So sometimes we just pub future episodes of the podcast, and that's the oath we make. And we'll in the next coming months we'll talk about the healthy engagement of counseling for Christians. Yeah. Uh, I think that'd be a <coughs> our family has benefited from counseling services as well. We've got counselors in the church. Um, there's difference between uh, licensed professional counseling and biblical counseling and pastoral counseling and there's just different And good spheres. counseling and bad counseling. There it is. <laughs> uh, so we hope on a time to think to give you good counsel. We Oof. want to step back and thoughtfully carefully engage with issues in the culture and the church, or as we'll talk about today, issues in the culture that affect the church. Mm-hmm. How, how do we in the church think through issues that are predominant and loud in the culture? And um, today we're, we're going to be talking about so-called Pride Month. And um, as we've said before, we started this podcast back in the day, particularly because sexuality and gender was being talked about ad nauseum, just yep. every day, all day, and we were not finding places that were just naturally cropping up from the pulpit mm-hmm. to speak about these issues. And, and then even, even then, the focus of a church service on Sunday is to promote hope in the resurrection of Jesus and his restoration of all things. Yep. And, and so it, even if we did go down um, these avenues frequently, we would start to steal some of the focus from the mm-hmm. fact that people have come to be reminded of the joy and the hope they have in the resurrection yep. of Christ. And so outside of the Sunday gathering, we found this this place to speak about um, in the current cultural context. A lot of times we're speaking about gender and sexuality. That's how we started the podcast. And when it comes to approaching the month of June, which has been labeled in our country Pride Month, we thought it was not just helpful, but necessary to take the next four weeks to help people in our church thoughtfully and carefully engage with all of the symbols and sights and sounds that they're going to be encountering over the next month. Right. Um, and so this, this, 
these next four episodes are going to, maybe six, we'll just see how those shake out. But the, the next few at least are going to focus on how Christians think through issues that crop up in Pride Month. And, and the first one, Chris, is just thinking about the beginning of the month and the barrage and the start of yeah. all, all of these things. Because it, if you're like me, you've spent all winter thinking, man, the summer's here. I can't wait for the right, summer. Right. And then it's like, oh, the first week of 70 degree temperatures all week. And then Pride Month. And yeah. you're, you're, you're not, you're a little caught off guard and, and, and it's going to be, ba- baseball teams are, are doing celebrations. Mm-hmm. And there's going to be, uh, just in the first weekend in Wausau, there's a parade. In the second weekend in Point, there's a parade. And, and there's going to be different banners at restaurants and and. and retail establishment large businesses displays. sponsor these things you know uh, health systems in our area sponsor these things i mean it's it's pretty significant and so pretty i significant. use the word barrage because it's all it all comes so fast and from so many different and angles. so furious and so furious fast and furious yeah fast and furious pride edition knowledge, i don't think the fast and the furious has come out with the pride no no but i'm i'm sure given enough time we're up to fast 10 right now um man just uh just keep your eyes peeled. Keep your eyes peeled. So, Chris, first of all, just reflect for me a little bit on <clears throat> the the inauguration, if you will. I mean, it's already <laughs> started with with different retail establishments right. and different uh, Major League Baseball teams putting out their plans to celebrate. And um, and like I said, it comes fast and it catches me off guard. <clears throat> How are you even beginning to process uh, the celebrations that happened in June regarding sexuality and gender? Yeah, man. You know, it's it's difficult. Um, as you're well aware, I have six kids, and the eldest uh, turns 15 today. And so I, I think my hope for a long time, you know, going back to 2013, was it 14? 2014, when the Obergefell decision came 15, down. 15, I think, right? I think it, well. I'm going to use the internet.com while you're 14 talking. 14 or 15, somewhere out there. Anyways, in the mid 2010s, in the mid 2010s, when the Obergefell case came down, I was still hopeful that even though the issue was a public issue, it was not an issue that would be pressing, uh, at least on, you know, the the idea was at least what was communicated by those advocating for uh, the advancement of this particular cause. The idea was not that they would be in your face anymore, that they were simply, quote, in your face in order to secure equal rights. Well, yeah, the whole communication was, you should stay out of my bedroom, which meant this is something I'm doing privately, and so don't. Don't be concerned with what I'm doing. Right. It was a communication of live and let live at that point. And so, you know, my hope was obviously I'm going to have to explain things that do not uh, do not line up with God's design for human experience, for human sexuality, for human relationship. But I was not prepared to see and by see, I mean, literally see to see such rampant displays of what would not only be considered, you know, now the mildly inappropriate activity of gay marriage, but now I guess just in an open, an open box that anybody can choose to dip into, uh, as a, you know, retailer, public establishment can dip into in order to kind of give their street creds to a particular segment of the community and to virtue signal. I wasn't prepared for that. And so um, the past couple of years have been particularly challenging for me as a father because, you know, not only do you see normalization of behavior that is contrary to God's design uh, regularly on television, and, and that's been going on for probably since 2020, to be honest, but um, now you're seeing blatant and graphic displays that demand conversation. You know, what's interesting about having kids, Chris, is it forces you to think through things you've been desensitized to. Right. So you have a kid and you, someone in your family has some reckless habits that you, you know, you just, as, as you grow up, you just get used to the reckless habits of the people sure. around you. But now you're going, oh no, I'm going to either have to explain this to my mm-hmm. kid or protect my kid from this. And it, and it resensitizes you. Yep. And I think the same thing happens here. We're like, okay, I might have gotten used to this or this or this, but oh, I got a 15 year old right. who's going to walk into that store, or I'm going to have to, you know, my kid's going to say, "What is that?" And I need an answer for that. Yeah. And I, I think it's actually really helpful in the same way that people go, 
I should be on my phone less because I don't want my kid to see me on my phone because mm-hmm. I don't want them to be on their phone as yeah. much as I, and it resensitizes right. you. Um, in many ways, having children resensitizes you to um, really an innocent, in some ways, segment of the population mm-hmm. that has not been exposed to certain things. Correct. And you're trying to figure out, oh, no, 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 this exposure to certain things shouldn't happen, and I need to right. guard and protect and explain yeah. in certain ways. Do you, do you feel like you mentioned 2015, which was Obergefell. Ah, um, good job. And then and, and in 2015, the communication was, yeah, leave us alone. Mm-hmm. Right, it's very much shifted away from leave us alone to public displays. You should agree. You should celebrate. Right. So it's gone from private to public. Yep. Do you have a sense for when, when there was some sort of um, transition from leave us alone in private mm-hmm. to this must be celebrated publicly? Yeah, I, I think honestly, and I don't. I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist when I say this, but you know. I do think that that the you can. Tinfoil hat is giving <clears throat> you away right now. Yeah, I well, don't wear hats. Don't I don't video. wear hats. I don't wear hats because they promote baldness, or they hide baldness. Yes, yes. Either Says way, the guy who is bald yes. and currently wearing a hat. Yes, I do not wear hats because, man, going back to like age eighteen, I would constantly ask the uh, the hair the hairdresser like, "Hey, am I going bald?" She'd always say, "No, not at all." My sister got a cosmetology degree after she got a psychology degree, and then she became an accountant. All kinds of wonderful, wonderful career pivots there, and she is an excellent and accomplished accountant at this point. But um, I would always ask her, Sarah, I'm losing my hair? No, Chris, you have nothing to worry about. And then I hit age 40, and I thought, I can probably stop asking that question at this point because I hit 40, and my hair is still intact. Yeah. Pretty much the same way as it it's, was when I was twenty. Solid. So you know that what? That might be your biggest conspiracy theory: is thinking hats are the problem. Some of the people. Oh that, man, it's science. Follow some, the science, Josh. Some of the people I know that wear more hats than anyone have the thickest hair I know. Then you got little old me, mm. who stopped wearing hats from age seventeen to twenty-five, effectively. And, really? And then guess where my hair went? I did not know that, Josh. I I because I f- hashtag follow yeah. the science. <laughs> like you're telling me to, I stopped wearing hats, and guess what? Yeah, I think actually the the weather in Wisconsin stress, man, my stress will do it. Okay, so anyways, we go saying, back. Yeah, I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist. Yeah, at the beginning of celebration. yeah. So I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but I think you look at what happened in the, in the year 2020 among the myriad of things that occurred in that year. I, I think one of the things that's noticeable generally, that I think everybody could probably agree on, regardless of where they're coming from on on a political level, is that identity politics took center stage in 2020. And identity politics, just for those who may not be aware, is effectively, instead instead of communicating ideas that are good for everyone, identity politics basically targets particular segments within the the culture, within a nation, um, and targets those segments and, said, and says to those segments, you will be benefited by us in the following way. And then, and then there's just a very, very strict messaging that takes place. And I think if you look at 2020, you see ways in which that type of identity politicking uh, ramped up significantly. Now, by all means, I think it's important to recognize the contributions of uh, of black Americans throughout history of our nation, uh, Asian America, those things are are fine. But what's happened over the past 25 years is that we've seen human sexuality and human sexual behavior go from being defined as sexual preference to identity. Mm -hmm. And so identity politics then has a place with taking a group that is identified on the basis of behavior and preference or emotional identity, right? You can't choose to not be an Asian American, right? right? You, you, you can get all the surgery you want in the world, but it's not going to change your DNA. However, in 2020, what happened was that people embraced, and by people, I mean those who are in positions to communicate through media and mass messaging, People embraced the, the vision for human experience that said that not only sexuality, but gender are things that are open up, uh, have been opened up to both human subjective impressions 
And then those human subjective impressions become locatable in the realm of identity politicking. So I think that year... Can you say all that <laughs> differently for people like me that trying to understand what you just said? <laughs> so Are you, you saying you explain said, this to me like I'm five? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, so y- what, I, what I heard, tell me if it's right or wrong yeah. or clarify, that um, you have what we would call immutable characteristics, immutable sure. or unchangeable. Yeah. So your race is, Im- or your ethnicity is immutable. Um, you, you cannot change from brown skin to white skin or white skin to brown right. skin. It's, it's immutable. We would put biological sex in that category as well. There is a, it's immutable. You cannot right. change. You can change superficially a surface level, but you, you can't change chromosomally. Right. You can't change reproductive organs functionally. Or visually. what you, or what you were. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but, but the, the desire, the sexual desire becomes the form of identity rather than immutable characteristics? Yeah, I, I would say sexual identity, that, here, here's where the creep came in. And by creep, I mean the, the you know, slowly moving, um, not creep like the Radiohead song or creep like some guy who's leering in a window. Uh, here's where the, the creep came in. The creep came in when Obergefell came about, there was a concerted effort for, I would say probably a good decade, perhaps even less than that though, a good decade to shift cultural language in regards to human sexuality away from sexual preference, which everybody, let me, let me qualify that. At some point, everybody would have agreed that sexual preference is an accurate reflection of what sexual behaviors that are reflected, whether it's in bisexuality, homosexuality, et cetera, that that, that would have been a reflection because people say, well, yes, I choose to do this, right? And, right? and so people would say, do not restrict my ability to do what I want to do. So it's volitional, it's, it's choice-oriented, right? So there was a concerted effort made to shift the language away from preference and choice to I cannot help what I was born as, mm-hmm. okay? So that is what factored into the Obergefell decision, which is for those, uh, I guess we should probably define terms for those who are not familiar with it. Obergefell was a decision in the Supreme Court where they erroneously concluded that um, equal protection um, extended to marriage amongst people who have not been traditionally considered married in the eyes of the vast majority of states in this country. Uh, So all constitutional amendments and laws that have been on the books restricting marriage uh, to one man and one woman were by fiat abrogated and those uh, those states no longer had the right to restrict and define marriage as had been always the case uh, in, you know, prior 200 years in the history of our country. So when a Burgerfield comes about, what effectively happens at that point is the language has been then used. The language was used to succeed and it succeeded in, in redefining the culture's understanding of what human sexuality was definable as. So it became an identity issue. It was no longer an issue of simply, I choose to do this, even though I may be X, Y, or Z sexuality, it's still my choice to do as I please. So desire has turned into personhood. Yes, desire has turned into personhood, feeling, and we talked about this last year, um, feeling it is fundamental to yeah. the human experience, right? So the curious thing that's happened is that people, and, and for years, you know, and, and this is where the gaslighting comes in, for years, and I mean, you probably remember this too, Josh, people were always looking for the, quote, gay gene. Right. Because they were so insistent. It was scientific, right? Yes. It, was, it was not even about morality. It was just, this is a science practice. Exactly. Exactly. And so they were so insistent on finding something genetic and scientific that, that basically provided for a view of human sexuality that was rooted in how someone was born, scientifically and biologically. Now, the strange thing, the really strange thing, um, I mean, first of all, we're in 2023, they've still not found it, even though we've sequenced the human genome, which probably helped factor into this, that they found there is no such thing as a gene that constructs human sexual experience, right? So they've never found it, but they haven't needed to find it anymore because the, the choice on the part of those who have catered to politicking, and I don't just mean in terms of you know government, but politicking, meaning catering to 
a particular class of people for the purpose of furnishing them a good so that they might furnish you something back. Um, politicking has changed now. And so it's no longer, the language is, and it's funny because people may like, oh, you silly old-fashioned so-and-so, you know that human sexuality and gender, there's, there's nothing scientific about it, right? Because it's all about feeling. And that's, that's what's shifted now. Since Obergefell, they, they did the work in 2015, they did the work of redefining the, the cultural dialogue regarding marriage. And once that was done, the shift was made then to start redefining human experience altogether, not just in terms of who you want to, quote, love or who you want to, quote, marry, but in terms of who you really are as a human being. And so that then has been the past eight years. But really in 2020 is when I think in earnest, um, those in positions of authority and, and, and power in our culture um, decided that it was time uh, during a season of broad political change that focused largely on identity politics, people decided now was the time to usher in an, a, another change in our dialogue. And that change was we no longer define human sexuality on the basis of a man and a woman or a man and a man or a woman and a woman, but a whoever you want to be with whoever, you, whoever they want to be. And that is, that is such a fundamental reorientation, pun intended, uh, a fundamental reorientation because any discussion now of biology, any discussion of genetics is completely dismissed. Because if you were to look at the genetics and biology of human gender and sexuality, of human gender and who you are as a male or female, you would find it's quite clear, cut and dry, there is a man and there is a woman, and in some extremely rare cases, there are those who are born with a, with a biological defect, just like somebody may be born with other disorders, uh, like perhaps born with one arm, uh, perhaps born with uh, half a brain. I mean, not, not to joke about it, but just there are some people who are born with significant biological defects because there have been, as a result of sin in the fall, uh, there have been you know, damage and decay uh, that's occurred in the human genome. Right, And so all of this to say, biology has now been replaced by personal feeling. Well, I think that's helpful, Chris, because one of the things I, I want to get across is to remind us that um, so early 2000s up to Obergefell, which we keep using as the marker, the conversation did seem to be more scientific, uh, less, less from the moral realm. Yes, it um, was. This is who I was born as. Not a, this is not a spiritual question. Right. This is not a moral question. This is, this is purely about. Yeah, it's it's just it's rational, it's right. mechanical, it's material, and so. Right. Um, but I think if we step back and observe, uh, the question has become moral again. What is it good to do, and right. who is it good to be? And I think that's why you see the shift from, like it, the total cell. You 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 celebrate what you think is beautiful. Right. And so if you're devoting a month... I celebrate ice cream, Josh. You do? Do yeah. you think ice cream is beautiful? Yeah. Until you eat it. Celebrated it last night, man. It was sprinkles. Do you just eat ice cream before we record podcasts? Because I think that was the last <sighs> we were time. We're celebrating Stan Kelderman's birthday, oh, Josh. Happy that's birthday, what we were Stan. doing, yeah. So that's where I think part of looking at, um, and not even a month-long celebration for Pride, but but we're talking about displays going up on the 20th or so of May. So now you're talking about a six-week celebration for Pride. Maybe it lasts after June. So you, you ask yourself, what, what about this is worth devoting six to eight weeks to? And you say, oh, it's because people are celebrating Pride as a moral good. So right. we've, we've gone from, um, hey, sex and sexuality are not morally good or morally bad questions. It's a scientific question. Right. It's a... It can be answered outside of religion. And now it's back to a what is a moral good question, which is why celebration is needed. You don't A new religion. Yeah, you don't celebrate things unless you think they're worthy of honor and worship right. or you think they're morally good. And right. so just to clarify for people that that's, that's what we're seeing is this is a fundamentally moral question about who is it good to be and what is it good to do and what is worthy mm -hmm. of celebrating. Um, and I think where where that becomes helpful is... You know, let's say the conversation is, well, all, all a pride parade is saying is express yourself. 
And, and I think it can be hard for people to step back and say, why would I be against someone expressing who they are? But a really easy question to ask is, who said that your sexual desires are who you are? Right, yeah. Wh- yep. Where did you get that from? Because you and I spent a year going back to mm-hmm. Nietzsche and Marx and Freud and saying Nietzsche and Marx eliminated external morality and then yep. Freud said the the sexual desires of an individual are, are what the define yep. them. Um, and like the taming of those desires and the expressing of those desires and the pursuit of happiness in those yep. desires. And and so now, a hundred years later, we're at a point where everyone just thinks, well, of course that's who you are. Right. But to step back and ask, most, I don't know that I've ever met a person who is heterosexual that's been like, that's who I am. Sure. But the pride movement has told anyone who has, you know, what's the origin of the word queer, it means weird, right? Right. I'm, we're reading through C.S. Lewis in my house right now, and C.S. Lewis wrote in the 1940s, I yep. think, and he uses the word queer all the time. Yeah, my, it, my kids have found that funny as well. Yeah. And it, it just throws me off, because yep. he's like, she spoke in a very queer way, and you're like, oh, man, uh, brain <laughs> malfunctioning. That, that may explain. That may explain. It, it means weird. And yeah. so when, when Target has a shirt that says queer, 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 queer on it, they're they're saying this is my identity. What what defines me as right. a person is that I'm weird in the in the sense of I'm different than all those other. Yeah. That's why you have words like heteronormativity. It's like right. ugh, the heteronormativity of of that. I'm different than that. Right. But who's who established that your sexual identity or sexual preferences, sexual orientation should be who you define yourself to be. Mm -hmm. That's a religious question. And as Christians, we need to be able to ask that question because if you're talking to someone who believes that, of course, that's just who someone is and they're expressing it, we need to help one another and help them see someone convinced you that that's your identity. And is that a good identity? And is there a better identity? Um, Because looking back at our... Christ to Culture series two years ago, I was reminded that when we, at least in Wausau, when we talked about transgenderism, I I shared the story of uh, the former Juno actress, Ellen Page. Mm -hmm. And Ellen Page said on Instagram that she uh, was identifying as a male. And and she said something that I thought was, I thought it was gut-wrenching, honestly. And, And I think that's part of this whole conversation is we should have sympathy for people who have been taught that they should identify as their sexuality when it's not going to provide the hope Mm -hmm. that they've been told it will. And so you have Ellen Page who says, now I'm Elliot, I'm a man, and then says, my identity is real, but it's fragile. Mm. And the question that I posed is, if your identity is real, why is it fragile? Yeah. Yeah. And, And the answer that I tried to give was, is there not a better identity to have Mm -hmm. that's not fragile? And we find that when the Lord tells us how to consider ourselves. Consider yourselves apart from me, alienated from the promises of God, but in me adopted as sons. Mm. Consider yourselves in need of radical transformation, but if you've come to Jesus as Lord and Savior, consider yourselves alive. Um, Consider yourselves not lonely and isolated, but part of the family of God. Consider yourselves in need of great change, but being changed by me. And um, these these identities given to us by God, uh, we need to hold out to people as better ways to identify ourselves rather than our sexual orientation Correct. preferences. And that's why generally, you know, there's a there's a conversation in Christian circles about something called side B Christianity, which mm. is, um, if I'm understanding it correctly, side B Christianity says. You, you, sh- you should not sleep with someone of the same sex. That's, that action, that behavior mm-hmm. is sinful. But if you experience that desire, then saying, I am gay is fine. Mm. Whereas um, generally, I think more Orthodox Christianity says it's not even okay to say, I am Correct. gay. Because if, if that is a sinful desire, which side B Christians agree with, mm. then why would you say, I am a sinful desire? Right. And that's why when we're having these conversations, I... I I think it's really important that we're very careful how we fin- finish the sentence, I am. Yep. Um, for instance, this is a non-sexuality related example. If you are in the church of Christ, not the church of Christ, but 
the denomination. denomination. Yes. If you were in Christ's church, and New Zealand. you regularly <laughs> say, I am a sinner. And that's the most frequent way you define yourself. Mm-hmm. I think that's problematic because I think the most frequent way the New Testament defines us is as saints and sons. Sure. Now, there is one time that I can count where Paul says, sinners of whom I am the for- foremost. So it's not absolutely zero right. times that the Apostle Paul says he's a sinner, but it's numerically almost minuscule. Sure. Because the point is, when I say I am, the end of that needs to be true and biblical. Yeah. And I am a holy one of God. I am blameless in Christ. I am a son. You know, mm-hmm. the, the end of the phrase, I am, is so doggone important. And what you see in the pride movement is they're giving you an answer to the question, who am I? And Christians have to step back and say, there's a better answer to that question. And to ask people lovingly, who said that was the best answer to the question? Right. right? So I think that's some of the things I'm observing as you talk about the shift in identity politics mm-hmm. is... Um, sometimes just one helpful question. So if someone says, why would I not want someone to express who they are? And you say, who says that's who they are? Right. You know what I find telling and ironic too, Josh, is that if we, you know, what I, what I like to do when it comes to just observing cultural trends in relationship to, you know, what, what is, what is humanity up to? What is it that we as, as a people are up to, right? Because all throughout human history, since the fall, We've collaborated like, with each other to do some, some awful things. And so as I think about this issue, I think, okay, what, what is it? Because all sin is ultimately striking at the heart of God in some capacity, right? And so it's, a, it's some type of redefinition. It's some type of a, of a reorientation. It's some type of, you know, looking elsewhere for something that God has in himself. And, you know, what, what is this? And I, I heard somebody say, I may have mentioned this past, but there was somebody that, uh, that had said in a kind of a, a monologue that transgenderism and Christianity are on a collision course. They, they can't exist side by side because Christianity says fundamentally God defines everything, whereas mm-hmm. transgenderism says you define everything. And I think what I find telling is, is you know, anybody who might be questioning, okay, well, is it, is it a thing that, that you know, it's, is it tenable for a Christian to, to believe that the claims of the transgender movement uh, can be entertained. And, and I would say no for multiple reasons, but here's, here's kind of a big picture reason that somebody may not have thought about before. When you look at the Bible, throughout Scripture, starting in the book of Genesis and then going into the incarnation itself and Jesus' public life and ministry, God goes to great lengths to declare his identity to people. And he expresses his identity in action, the way that he speaks, the way that he behaves toward I people. I am the God who brought you out of Israel. Exactly. That's how he finishes. Exactly. The, the, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments start with, you know, I am the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I mean, that's how the Ten Commandments start. God reveals himself to Moses as, as the God who is, right? Mm-hmm. So God is absolute. If you want to put it in these terms, God is absolute identity. I mean, he is right? And so identity is a question about what is. And what have we done? And, and this is how I think the church is complicit because I, I don't want to let the church off the hook in these, in these issues. The church has been complicit because for the past 30 years, since the start of the mega church movement, you go back to Willow Creek and, and people just kind of throwing themselves at, at the culture without much consideration for the compromise that it may bring into the life of the church. People have said, you know what? We just want to meet people where they're at. Well, in the process of quote, meeting people where they're at, what we've done is we have, we have made it okay. Uh, preachers have made it okay. Pastors have made it okay. Some theologians have made it okay to undefine God. And to say it's really not that important what you believe about God. It's really not that important that you believe God to be this, that, or the other thing as scripture should define him. What's more important is that he believes in you effectively. What's more important is that you know that God loves you. Now, by all means, know that God loves you. If you are in Christ, know that God loves you as an adopted son or daughter into his family. And that is without question. If, if you have come to trust in Christ, if you haven't, then please uh, understand God's wrath remains upon you because you don't have reconciliation through his son. But we've gone to great lengths to de-identify God and to put ourselves at the center of who God really is. 
And what has the transgender movement done and what has the LGBT movement done over the past several years now is it's gone to great lengths to give humanity the ability to find itself. And so at the same time that the church has been eliminating a God with definition, we have been entertaining a humanity that is, that is self-defined. And so that's the thing I think is just curious about this, because you look throughout the Bible, God says over and over, I am, I am, I am. And as Jesus comes on the scene, the fact that he says, I am, is the most peculiar of all of his statements or miracles, because Mm -hmm. he is making the ultimate claim that he is God Almighty. So now what has the transgender movement done? It said, I am. And they fill in the blank with whatever they say they are. And it is the ultimate robbing uh, from God of the right to determine. Yeah, and that's where I, I think it's important to note the difference. Once again, I, I wanna I wanna not only set clear we, we want to speak clearly, like as we've been doing, and this is right and this is wrong. And I also want to give people tools to to think through how are they engaging on a Facebook post or with a family right. member or um and so one of the things that goes to my mind, Chris, is you know, if someone says what well, all they're doing is expressing themselves. I think one of the things we have to understand is that um, expression has turned into indoctrination and mm-hmm. inculcation. And yep. I use those words. Um, I've joked with you before. I think we should all be clear that we're always trying to indoctrinate people. Sure. So if you come to Downtown Mission Church on Sunday, I'm trying to indoctrinate you with the truth of the scriptures. That's my uh-huh. goal. Um, and the the goal of the pride movement is to indoctrinate us with a worldview about humanity. Right. And so that's why that's why I'm getting so bent out of shape because it's becoming more and more clear to me that the goal is to teach me something. Yeah. Um it's becoming more and more clear that the cel- like if you if you say something is moral and something is so morally good we should celebrate it, you're trying to teach me to celebrate it. Right. And in some cases demand me to celebrate it. So you're trying to instruct me. That's where the word indoctrination comes with. And the word inculcation comes from the repetition. Mm. Why is this not a one-day event? Why is this the month of June? Uh, you ask yourself the question, why do mothers get one day? Yeah, we celebrate moms, but we yeah. don't indoctrinate on motherhood. So why do mothers get one day, but the pride movement gets effectively six weeks since displays come up? And now the month of October, too, has become pride month. Has it really? Yeah, it's, uh, it, is gay, it is gay history month now. Okay. So, yeah. So if you ask yourself why the number of days, it's because inculcation, repetition. Yep. And, um, and we can't combat the totality of repetition by you know, one podcast every couple weeks here. Um, but that's what happens is when you hear over and over again from a news outlet, over and over again from a culture, over and over again during the month of June, be who you are. Right. They're, you're being taught something. And we need to be able to understand when we're being taught something and to react with a biblical worldview because um, I'm just thinking through like, uh, you you had mentioned the transgender movement replacing the I am with who you are. And, And Christians need to be aware of what that statement is where it's, I am free to determine myself. Yeah. Well, not in the Bible's view of who the Lord is. Um, I was just, you know, just talking with uh, a friend and a brother, and we're going through Genesis 1 and 2 and talking about God creating male and female and God creating male and female in his image. And one of the things we talked about is, okay, if, if the Bible is true, and if we're Christians submitting to the Lordship of Jesus, that's part of it, is understanding that Jesus is the Word, mm-hmm. and the Word became flesh, and the word is not only Jesus made flesh, but also the words of God. And so you, okay, I need to listen to what Jesus says and what the whole of the scriptures say. And Genesis says, male and female, he created them in the image of God. He created them. And so what happens is if we tamper with the creation, we tamper with the image. Right. And so if, the, if what we're being taught is you determine who you are, that flies in the faith of God, face of God determines. Right who you are. And so those are the reason you said the transgender movement and Christianity cannot coincide is because those are two fundamentally different views of humanity. Is, is my personhood created by Mm. God and given to me, or is it discovered by me and determined by me? And, And, and that is, 
th- those are two completely different worldviews. And, and what the pride movement is effectively seeking to teach is you are the determiner. Right. Yeah, there's, there's no disparate, there's no more disparate thing that you'll find in terms of identity as a God who says, I am who I am, right? And he ties that to his glory. Effectively, he's like, my glory I will not give to another. I am the Lord, right? So God says, I am you know, in the covenant name of God just means I am who I am. It's being. God is, God is, right? So you have a God who says, I am who I am, and you are who you say I are. Who You, say, you are who you say I am. Mm-hmm. You are who You're gonna get I there. say. You are who I say you are. There we go. There we go. Lots of small words. I have trouble putting small I words together. I am who I am. And I say who you are. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. I didn't need to put other yous in. Thank you. This is why we have multiple people on this. Um, You know, that's, and and even there's a worship song that we sing in in Point, and I'm not sure if you guys still are do sing at Wassa, but uh, I am who you say I am. You know, that's that's a worship song because you're saying you are reflecting to God no matter what other people say, and I would say in our current culture, no matter what I feel or think. God, I am who you say I am. And you can say that for the unregenerate sinner. You are an unregenerate sinner because God says you are. And for the Christian, you are dearly loved, though deeply flawed, son or daughter of the living God, right? You are who I say you are. So there's nothing more disparate than that worldview and then the worldview that says, I reserve the right to say, I am who I am. That the human being can say, I am who I am. Yeah, I read, um, I read an article back in the day um, from regular podcast cameo referencing Scott Swain. He's never been on the podcast, but we talk about him all the time. Um, and Maybe he, one of these days. He defined humanity as dependent. Mm-hmm. So not, you know, he said we could define humanity as image bearers. We could define humanity as workers. We could define, but fundamentally humanity is dependent. God yep. is independent. Humanity is dependent. And the idea of dependence is I need, I need everything from God. Yep. I need him to tell me who I am. I need him to sustain my body. And, yep. um, and what's, what's, if we, if we even just step back and think about what the, the movement is called, it's the pride movement. Right. And Okay. I don't mean to be a total curmudgeon. There are certain times where it's good to be proud. Proud of my son. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, generally good. You know, you could be proud that you, you know, I, we finished Luke the other day. And sure. I'm like, you know what? We did that. Yeah. We spent two years in it. We should all be proud that we, um, there's, there can be a healthy pride. Um, the scriptures also say pride goes before destruction. Yep. Um, in, in Ezekiel, when they're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, it's pride that leads to abomination. Yep. And Christians need to take seriously that that pride, particularly pride in humanity, is what built a tower in Babel. Yes. Pride in humanity, where we start to self-determine rather than receive from God what is true and right and good, yeah. uh, it leads to destruction. That's the proverb. Pride goeth before destruction, saith the kjv Yeah. <laughs> and, and so in regards to sexuality, um, it's a very simple question is, who gets to determine? Yep. Who is Lord? And that's a question we answer when we first come to faith in Christ is, oh no, I've been acting, I've been acting as Lord, but this whole time I've been a servant and I've been defying the Lord. Yep. I need to repent and go back to the Lord. And this Lord is gracious to receive me like mm-hmm. the father does the prodigal son. How on earth is a Lord that I've defied gracious right. to receive me? And that's how we repent and come and see the mercy yeah. of Christ. But fundamentally, one of the shifts is, I knew God, but I did not honor him as such. But then that question keeps getting asked. Who gets to determine uh, mm. my view of sexuality? Yep. Me as Lord or the Lord as Lord? Um, and Lord, the, the word, it has the idea of ownership in it. Yep. And so when we're looking at two very different worldviews, one says, I take direction from him. Mm-hmm. The other says, I have pride in me. And a Christian, by definition, must take direction from Jesus or you're not a Christian. I mean, that, that is by definition, uh, Jesus said, 
look, you can't be my mm-hmm. disciple unless, and then he put some pretty strict restraints on, yeah. on the Christian saying, you, 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 you gotta lay down your right to define yourself, to define your pleasure, to define your happiness, to define your end goals. You got to do it. And so they, they are mutually exclusive. The Christian cannot, without doing violence to his actual identity as a Christian, cannot forsake a complete and total submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in order to adopt a different view of himself or the world around him. Right. So we, we've covered some broad stuff and we've gone on some tangents here. I think the, the whole purpose of this conversation was we wanted to get a podcast out before or slash on June 1st, knowing that, um, knowing that kind of the barrage has already started with, I mean, there's been a whole hullabaloo with Target. That's going to be a bit of a dated conversation, I think, by the time this comes out. But, you know, we're sitting here on May 24th and the past two days has been dominated by a mm. Target pride display and yeah. people being upset with that and Target doing the non-apology apology and removing it, but kind of blaming people that were, pr- I mean, it's just, right. it's just a mess. So we wanted to get something out to say, as you're seeing these things, what are the types of categories to think through? Um, one of them we put forth is what is morally good? The pride movement is telling you what is mm. morally good. Um, yeah. One of them is identity. The pride movement is telling you how to identify. Uh, one of them is self-determination. So we've, we've covered some broad scope things yeah. here that we wanted to get on people's minds. My last question, Chris, you, you mentioned at the very beginning of this podcast that you are a father of six. Um, I'm a father of one, and there are many mothers and fathers in our church, many people with nieces and nephews. Yeah. And I think the lasting question is, as we go about this month as Christians, what do we say to our children when they come across a banner or a parade or a display that is covered in rainbow imagery, mm. and they say... What is that? Yeah. You know, I, I would say that the, probably the, the most helpful thing to say that that's suitable for all occasions, suitable for all ages, is to say um, those people are celebrating a lifestyle that does not honor God. And that's probably the most diplomatic thing I can say to one of my children. Um, you know, in Ephesians, it talks about don't speak about the things that the pagans do in secret because it's shameful to even mention them. And I know that my wife has pushed back at times because my, my kids very thankfully, my kids have, have understood that this isn't, this is evil, you know, that this is behavior that is completely contrary to a life that honors God. But sometimes in their zeal, um, they can say things that are just too much, Mm-hmm. right? Just, just too much. And, and so my wife will helpfully push back in those moments to say, kids, you don't need to let it consume your thinking, right? So even though you may see rainbows everywhere, you don't need to let that determine for you the way you see the world. And so I think that's, like that's a helpful statement of that's dishonoring to the Lord. Right. Is it like, you could think that every time you see it, if you want to, and it could, and now my mind's on a different thing. Right. Right. Now, that being said, and I think this is a question, maybe we'll talk about this in, in future episodes here, and I know we've talked about it privately, but I think there is a place to ask the question of a mature Christian. What, what do you do in response to these things that are so offensive? You're, you're talking response, not just how do you respond to your kid's question, but right. maybe some sort of public What response. you actually do outside of the bounds of just a, of a conversation with your kids. And I think at that point, your conversation with your kids turns into a little bit of a different one because, you know, I, I, I do feel that, that the church has seeded ground on the issue of, of morality in sexuality. I think that we have turned it into an issue where we've played around with it at times and we've been a little bit too nice uh, with, with how some of these things have developed over the years. That doesn't mean that we need to be mean or cruel, or unsympathetic, or discompassionate toward people who, who live in a certain way. But it does mean that there are legitimate questions to be asked where we are at a point which we would not necessarily have gotten to if we had said something sooner, but we're at a point where, you know, there are 
without going into details, you and I are aware of, you know, Target selling swimsuits that are catered toward a very disgusting physical act, mm-hmm. right? So how do you say something? Because once the, you know, the, the old, the old TV line is jumping the shark, right? It comes from a happy days episode where Fonzie is water skiing and jumps over a shark. And it's just, it's just basically you, you've so pushed the, the, the limits of cred of like credibility at that point. You're like, okay, well now you've, you've really just kind of crossed the line into absurdity almost. And, and so I think the culture has jumped the shark in some ways where, where we are, entertaining these things and most people are looking at it and they well well some people may say well people can live as they want most people are saying this has gotten really weird and and i think that weirdness does impact children um i i do get concerned for how kids see these things so how do we actually yeah i, deal I with have that, that written down what do christians do publicly actively yeah that's a really good question um and i also um written down that we're going to spend some time talking about language because uh, sure. something you just mentioned, if if we had done some things earlier, I think language is one of those um, yeah. where there are words like marriage that the definition matters and, and there are times where Christians didn't fight it hard enough for right. that definition. Words like male and female that matter. Yeah. Um, and so we have to figure out how to be... Um, compassionate while also not caving on language. That's, yep. a, that's a real Christian need is to be yep. compassionate in speech while not caving on language. And yep. so we'll talk about that. Um, one other tip as we're thinking, what do we, what do we say if our, if our kid asks, what is that? Uh, I think it's also helpful to extol using a biblical word, which means praise in and rejoice, extol the beauty of Genesis one and two. Mm. You know, what is that? Well, son, God is so good mm. that he created us equal male and female, yeah. but different. Yep. He is so good that in his image, he wanted to display himself by creating us male and female yeah. and giving us equal dignity, but different functions. Yep. He's so good. And, yep. and the first thing he did after he created male and female is he blessed them. He is so good. And gave you know, them to this, a unique relationship. This symbol means that people don't believe in God's goodness in creating male right. and female, but we do because God is good. Yeah. I mean, how... It, there, there is a time for negation to say that is bad, but Christians often fall into only doing that, and, yeah. and we miss the chance to extol God's beauty mm-hmm. in his creation. And a huge part of salvation is seeing God's beauty and coming mm. to see him as good when he gives commands or good when he yeah. gives discipline. And so let us regularly extol. If you have a two-year-old or a <laughs> four-year-old, and you maybe think they are, they are way too young for some of these conversations. What they are not too young for is you to repeatedly yep. say, look at the goodness of God's, God's creation. Yep. You can say that every day. Isn't it so cool, son, that mommy is different than daddy? Hmm. Isn't it amazing that, that mom can do different things than hmm. dad can do? And yeah. You could do that at age one. Make it repetitive in your home to extol the beauty of God's design so that we would all go, why would we want anything else? And when they get to be teenagers, they can remind you of the things that you can't do, right? The <laughs> <laughs> Says the guy whose daughter turned 15 today. Yep, that's correct. Well, Who's that, a wonderful girl, by the way. So, is. Lydia, She's I'm great. so proud of you for the young lady you are. That's good pride, brother. Yeah. And that's not just performative pride. You told me that off air yeah. a couple of days ago how proud you are of your daughter. Yep, absolutely. So this has been another long time to think. We hope it's been helpful for you, good for you, goodful, to use the phrase coined by Chris Tillman, we are available, right? So we're married, not to each other. We're married. We're not available relationally, do, but we are available. I don't know that any of that. Define, define was. available, Josh, please. Well, I was taking a pregnant pause before defining available. We are available should you have Ah, yes. Right? Okay. So yes. obviously we are at a time in this podcast, this is not a national podcast. That, you know, it's is, international, in fact, because we know we have some friends who listen over in... Like two of them. Well... Okay. The point they're being... They're still people, and they still matter. So our German friends who listen, thank you. Okay. Well, you can email Danke us. Shane. It's going to be Shane. harder for you to see us in person if you're in Germany. But you can email <laughs> us. For the vast majority of our listeners, you probably know where we live. You know where we are on Sundays. You have our phone number. If something in this has sparked 
a thought in you or a question in you or a disagreement in you, we are available to talk. Uh, you can Pastor Chris at downtomissionchurch.com, Pastor Josh at downtomissionchurch.com. Um, until then, thanks for taking some time to think. <laughs>